So this session is called Getting PR Done the Kiwi Way, the New Zealand Way. And we're really pleased that we have two guests with us, Phil Saxby and Carolyn Glass. And both of them are members of our Facebook group. And both of them have at different times given very helpful contributions when we get bogged down in something about PR in this country. And it's really lovely to sort of reach out across the oceans that people who are experienced uh, PR campaigners uh, to, to be there with us and give us suggestions, etc. Because you see, what has happened, and I speak here as a Canadian, the colonials have taught the Brits a few things. They taught them in particular how to get a fair voting system or a fair voting system. And it's really lovely as we you know, are battling away here to try and do our best to win over the Labour Party, the PR, which we think will be the big step to really transform the campaign for PR in this country, to have them here with us. And get PR done, just to be clear, is a cross-party, no-party group set up in January 2020. And we just work all, all it seems like 24-7, to try and get PR done. And our focus initially is on the Labour Party. So as I said, here comes a couple of ex-colonials to teach the Brits how to get a fair voting system. And they are the following people. One is Caroline Glass. Caroline Glass is the co-policy director uh, for the New Zealand Greens. She wrote her dissertation on the MMP system in New Zealand and was with us last August. It went over so well uh, that we invited her back. We only had 200 people in the group now at that time. Now we have um, 2,500. Uh, so we figured that she could come back for a new audience. And the other person is, uh, so that's a greenie there from New Zealand. The other person is Phil Saxby. Phil is from the Labour Party in New Zealand, and he is a person who was there in the trenches, what was it, 40 years ago, um, when um, they formed a cross-party group called the Electoral uh, Reform Coalition in 1986, and seven years later, they in fact had their second of their two referendums, and they were on the way then to getting a much fairer voting system. So. Uh, no, they're going to both be interviewed from my colleague, Ian Glenister, who's the co-editor co of the In Proportion blog uh, that Get PR Done does. We've done about 14 blogs about different kinds of issues related to PR. And Ian did one about a month ago on, in fact, New Zealand. Uh, and, uh, so, uh, and Phil helped a great deal in that. So, Ian, over to you. Okay, thank you, Alan, and uh, welcome, Phil and Caroline, and uh, I hope you've uh, got enough caffeine inside you for this. I've, I've only got a few questions for you. You kind of know what they are, and you've, you've, you know what you're going to say, basically, so I'll let you do most of the talking, but if there's any issues of clarification, if you don't mind, I'll just jump in and ask a few uh, supplementary questions, and then there's a couple of questions that I've, I'm going to reserve for the end, uh, surprise questions. They're not very I'm much of a surprise, so don't worry. <laughs> um, but I'd like to know a little bit for the British audience who, I mean, we are, well, most of us progressives are desperate to get uh, proportional representation done in the UK. You know, the, the, the confidence in the political system is dire. Um, and so, you know, you are a living example, really, of the transition between first past the post and, uh, and, and PR. But I'd like to know a little bit, if you don't mind, both of you, um, to, to know a little bit about what it was like pre-PR and what were the pressures that were pushing people towards changing the system? Uh, could you start with that, Phil? Thank you. Um, kia ora koutou, everyone. We're, um, I'm delighted to be here and um, be part of this event uh, and if I can help with any um, future work I'm very happy to do that too. Uh, it's been a long time coming this uh, campaign. I've got something here from, um, I don't know if you can see that, that's the um, Labour Party's um, proportion representation 1986, I think it was, yeah, 1989 actually, yeah, Labour LCER, I don't know if that's still going. Um, but we were inspired by you guys up to a point because, you know, there was a, 
uh, campaign going on uh, in the UK when we were when our organisation began. And to answer your question uh, briefly, I think that we found ourselves in uh, 1986 when we started the organisation um, with a history, a recent history of um, serious uh, concern about how well the voting system worked. It was that it was that direct. Um, the if in two previous earlier elections, uh, 1978 and 1981, uh, the Labour Party had won more votes than the National Party here, uh, and yet the uh, National had gained a majority, I think, in both those elections, uh, an actual absolute majority, uh, on roughly 39% of the vote. Uh, so we had gone through this period, especially within the Labour Party, thinking, uh, a lot of people thinking, this isn't working well, and it's, I think, because of that, that it was the Labour Party that put forward a resolution, um, a, a, you know, uh, put forward a, a promise in their 1984 election uh, manifesto that they would hold a Royal Commission into the electoral system. And it was just that disquiet about the, uh, the result of elections, recent elections in, the, um, in New Zealand. Okay, so, so that's... Uh... Pretty clear. So basically, the, the situation in, in, in New Zealand in the 1970s was that there was a, a huge amount of disquiet. But I, I'm interested in into whether the uh, whether the impetus was that was that a was the public was it public disquiet or was it amongst political circles? Uh, well, it was enough of a campaign for people in. Uh, oh, sorry, it was widespread enough for uh, the Labour Party conference to receive remits. Oh. Um, and promise which had not been the subject of remits for a long time. I mean, you'd have to go back 50 years before uh, proportional representation was a thing in New Zealand. Um, and in fact, <clears throat> when it was a thing in New Zealand, it was the single transferable vote, mm. um, which I have in uh, Wellington City. Um, but in um, Christchurch in the 1930s, uh, the city used the single transferable vote um, but that was only, it took it was 50 years after that that um, we started getting interest in electoral reform in New Zealand uh, Labour Party, and that was really because of those two elections. Um, and it, and it was widespread. It wasn't just the New Zealand Labour Party. It was obviously the smaller parties, the Values Party, which was the early Greens Party in 1972, got five percent of the vote and no seats. Um, and uh, in 1978. The, in 81, the Social Credit Party um, got around uh, 17, 18, 20 percent of the vote and only one or two seats, two seats in mm. uh, I think one of those elections. That was the maximum out of when they would have been entitled to about 20 seats um, in, on the basis of their numbers. Right. So there's, there's, there was some kind of groundswell of opinion saying we've got to change things. Things aren't quite right. But the, the big two, you know, Labour and National, were pretty much overall against it, would you say? Any change? Well, we moved slowly because we didn't have unanimity within um, the Labour Party. Geoffrey Palmer's um, was very keen. He, was, he became the Minister of Justice and it was his baby. Um, he had written a book um, on um, electoral election systems and um, that was followed up by unbridled power. Uh, or, yeah, there, was, there was two versions of the unbridled power book, both of them um, talking about electoral um, systems. And so there was um, definitely support within the Labour Party, um, but it wasn't, there was no unanimity on, on what system should be used. Uh, and there was no, um, uh, no consensus that there needed to be even changed. There was quite um, vehement opposition from some MPs to any idea about proportional representation. But we certainly had, within the Labour Party, a contest going on uh, over that at the highest levels uh, and at you know, mm -hmm. branch levels. And would you say when, when uh, David Longy made a, made a bit of a, well, to some, a faux pas when he was interviewed uh, in 1987 prior to the election then, when he promised just a week before the election that he would hold a binding referendum, that must have come as a surprise to, 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 well, to you and many other people. Uh, yes, it was a, <clears throat> something of a surprise. Um, we we were approached by um, TVNZ and our television um, to submit questions. Well, no, uh, we submitted a question uh, on the TVNZ asking four questions uh, on the election, 
and they came and interviewed me in my house and uh, I asked the question, not expecting, and it was a question on the referendum. As I say, we were going slowly so as not to frighten the horses. We were going for the referendum, which is what the Royal Commission had recommended in uh, uh, the previous year, 1986. We were going for the referendum and we are, I asked the question on the referendum and um, Longy said not uh, he, he would go one better than national, which was talking about a, uh, an advisory referendum on having an upper mm. house. Uh, he would go one better than that and they would have a binding referendum on proportional representation. Uh, so it was a surprise. That was the first we'd heard of it and we had no, no warning that that was coming. Right, and I presume that got the ball rolling, as it were, for everybody, and, and it began to build up impetus? Yeah, the, there'd been a whole year of debate in 1987 with us um, promoting uh, our, our organisation, you know, going out there and promoting uh, MMP um, to and the idea of the referendum, those two things, um, we, we agreed we would promote MMP and or understanding of MMP because at, at that point, it was completely new. We hadn't had any experience of PR for 50 years, as I say. Um, MMP was a completely new term that had been invented by the Royal Commission in 1986, and um, so it was unknown. So we were, prom pros we were promoting awareness and understanding of what MMP was, uh, but we were promoting a referendum on PR. We didn't really care what form of PR it was going to be, uh, as long as it was a proportional system. Okay, and so let's talk about the campaign then, and let's talk about the role of uh, the ERC, how, how important your role was, or the, your organisation, uh, and, and if there are any lessons that we can pick up from, from, from that in, in the UK, maybe, maybe there's some questions that will be coming along uh, later on that regard, but let's pick up that from 1987, from Longy's famous statement, what happened after that, and how did, you, how did BR happen in New Zealand? Well, uh... That was the milestone, that was a crucial milestone. The first milestone was actually getting the Royal Commission, which was a Labour promise, but when, and they did carry out that promise. Uh, the second milestone was Longy actually coming out, big milestone, was Longy coming out and supporting what the Royal Commission had said. One thing I haven't mentioned up to now is uh, the Maori dimension. Yep. In New Zealand, there had been debate for uh, about, or questions about the representativeness of Parliament for a long time. And the two issues that were mostly talked about were um, the lack of women's representation, very small, small numbers of women, um, more than some countries, like more than Australia, but um, that mm. wasn't a high bar. And, um, and the other problem was the Maori representation, because um, for 100 years or so, from over 100 years, we'd had um, four uh, Maori seats in Parliament, and they had stayed the same at the same number despite the Māori population um, growing considerably in numbers uh, over, or declining at first, and then growing again um, as, um, as time went on, the, the percentage of Māori population grew mm -hmm. to around 16%, uh, 17 it is now, and um, the number of seats stayed the same, basically um, about 5% of the number of seats at the time, 4 or 5% over when I was young. Um, so there was quite a lot of angst about that and it was that issue the Maori representation which actually swung the Royal Commission I believe to supporting a fair system because that was the critical thing that had to be done right it was unacceptable to come up with a system that, that wasn't going to address the problem of fair Maori representation that's not a, much of a parallel for um, the UK yeah. you know you're not going to have Very any, different, uh, yeah. Similar, uh, you know, there's no 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 uh, parallel there that you can you can see, um, but the women's vote representation was an issue, and um, and we always had cons you know, uh, considerable support from all women's organisations uh, for our campaign. We we used the, the uh, we had network the women's electoral lobby in New Zealand, um, so that there was uh, and we gradually brought the Maori. Um, uh, institutions over to supporting MMP to the extent that when we had the final referendum in 1993, uh, we got our highest vote in the Maori electorates. Uh, so we, we mm -hmm. brought them over from originally just wanting more separate seats. Um, that was their, their aim, was to simply just get the number of seats scaled up and not worry about the rest of the system. Uh, they came over to the MMP concept and voted very strongly for it.
Okay. Another difference um, from from the Royal Commission was that you know the outcome was diff- that was different was that the the threshold the qualifying threshold was raised from four percent to five percent. So in other words, if a party didn't get uh, a certain percentage, they would not be represented in in Parliament. Um, that is now being looked at, I understand. But what what was the effect of that raise from four to five percent, and why why was it done like that? Uh, the four percent was recommended by the Royal Commission. Um, mm. It was trying the conservative. The four percent is still a high threshold at the time. Um, it would have been one of the higher ones at the high end with um, Germany at five percent. Um, now the there's been a trend since the Royal Commission's report for other thresh, other countries to adopt higher thresholds. Israel, for example, um, has gone for a higher threshold. So now that four percent looks pretty uh, much in the, you know, three or four percent looks pretty much the normal MMP threshold that you would expect to have. I think the only explanation for the five percent was that um, National that was um, putting the legislation forward was uh, very keen to have as little, uh, as as few small parties as possible. Um, They weren't really uh, themselves committed to the idea of a fair representation. They, They set out to to undermine it by having that high threshold of 5%, and Labour basically just went along with it. Okay. Now, the ERC um, was, was created in, 90, in 1986 to, compa- to campaign for this proportional voting system. And one of the, one of the ways you did it was to, to somehow achieve a notion of neutrality. You did this without sort of buying into any political party as such, and, or, or arguing against political ideas as it were uh, how important do you think that is for, uh, for going forward for, say, say for example if we were to try and push for this in the uk w- would you recommend having a similar organization uh, to to the erc well i think the uk is at a different um, situation from what we were in where we were in new zealand um, i think that in france for example pr has been a partisan issue as the right has always been opposed to it or te- mostly opposed to it and the left has supported um, having um, a chip switch to proportional representation so de gaulle brought in the 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 um we, uh, the two ballot um weaker parts uh, voting system and the, uh, the socialist party that's always been supporting um, a, a switch back to proportional representation, which France had in the 30s. Mm-hmm. So yeah, I think that Britain is just in that situation, which we weren't, um, that uh, it's become a partisan issue and it will be won or lost on the basis of partisan support. We in New Zealand deliberately set out to make a non-partisan thing. We recruited former National Party Prime Minister, John Marshall, Sir John Marshall to be our, one of our patrons. Uh, we had a former Labour Party president as one of the patrons, and a, uh, Angela Folks from the Combined Trade Unions. Um, she uh, was one of the uh, the other the third patron. So we tried to get a, a balance there, uh, and we set out all the way along to be a party which uh, a, an organisation which was non political, non partisan. And I do applaud the way in which the Get PR Done has tried to make sure that this isn't seen in a factional way, it's not seen in in a very highly partisan way. But I think overall, it seems to me your debate in the UK is 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 sort of irretrievably become a partisan thing between the left and right. Um, And even within the left, there's there's disputes as well. But um, yeah, you you, you try and be as broad as you can. And I applaud the, um, the approach that you've taken. Um, but I think it, it'll never, it, you, you're not really in a position to be as broad in your approach as we were in New Zealand, we were able to be in New Zealand. And that's, and we were going for a referendum, so we had to take that a broad approach. We had to aim for broad um, citizen support because that's the whole, the whole campaign right from the start in New Zealand was a campaign for a referendum. And that's mm-hmm. something that's not the case in the UK. Yeah, and I think the idea that you had of having a preferendum and um, putting out uh, ideas that uh, New Zealand people could, could get engaged with first was quite a clever one. Could you tell me how that originated? Well, um, we we in the Electoral Reform Coalition were always arguing for the, the soonest possible move to a, a electoral uh, a, a change in the system. 
So we weren't the ones that were advocating a slow, careful, methodical process um, towards the uh, referendum, uh, towards um, a change. Uh, you saw the T-shirt before that was calling for MMP to be in 1993, not a referendum in 1993, but MMP in 93. Mm. Um, but of course, it had the double effect that if we did get a referendum in 93, then it would be, you know, it would be a call for a vote for MMP in 93. So it worked both ways. But even so, um, we actually wanted to see the thing, the progress, progress made faster. And we we're always asking for that. Um, what happened was that the Minister of, <coughs> Ministry of Justice in New Zealand um, advised the minister who accepted uh, the advice that the uh, public uh, shouldn't be given a, um, um, they had to be given two votes if, uh, on MMP, on, on the voting system, if there was going to be a change vote first then people could, uh, that, that couldn't be the final vote. They had to be, uh, the final vote had to be on one system. Yeah. And they'd already committed themselves to, you know, in, obviously as a party, they, they talked it through and decided that, that it, it wasn't clear to them anyway that um, MMP was the, the right way to go and they weren't going to just give people a vote on uh, MMP alone. They were, they were determined to give people a vote on, on um, the on multiple options and they were advised that it was impossible to expect people to vote on the multiple options and also to then cut and have a final and treat that as being the final vote. They had to have two, um, two, mm. two full referendums separated by, you know, as it turned out, about a year um, and from one, you know, between the preferendum in 1992 and the final uh, binding referendum in 1993. So that's how it worked out that the National Party itself decided that they would, they would not um, simply just have a vote on, and we were very fortunate because that meant that there was a great deal of discussion about yeah. MMP in 1992, and that we won so overwhelmingly that it became, uh, it, it got a boost from that alone. What, what was it about MMP versus uh, the single transferable vote, which New Zealand already had some experience of it, albeit a long time ago? What was it about MMP that particularly appealed to New Zealand, do you think? Um, I think the MMP was, had been promoted by us and, and by uh, um, some MPs and the journalists and people were uh, understanding of it. We also, during the election, during that referendum campaign, had um, a very, very um, committed uh, and you know, a lot of money put into it by the Alliance Party, which was new, this was in 1992, and the Alliance Party had been formed as a result of breakaways from both National and Labour. Um, they brought in the Green Party, they brought in um, the, uh, the breakaway Labour Party was called New Labour, um, not to be confused with um, Tony Blair's New Labour. This was no. um, Jim Anderson's New Labour. It was on the, uh, on the uh, traditional uh, Labour, um, uh, it, was, uh, it was promoting the um, 1930s Labour Party ideals rather than 1980s um, uh, 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 policy. So yeah, we had New Labour breaking away from, uh, from Labour, we had the Liberals breaking away from National, we had um, a Maori Party breaking away, Mana Motahaki, and um, the Greens had, as I say, had sort of started to form um, a long time earlier um, in the values, originally as a values party and then as a Green Party. Um, so it was uh, that alliance formed um, uh, was formed to bring all these groups together and to fight the 1993 election. And, and uh, their first uh, big uh, campaign, perhaps, was the the referendum campaign. And they put a lot of money into that, and they promoted MMP alone. Mm -hmm. uh, and that uh, that I think, and from within Labour too, there was considerable support for MMP. Um, there was no, there were only two MPs that were actively campaigning for the single transferable vote. Both of them Labour. Uh, one of them went on to um, form his own party, United Future, and um, the other one became the um, head of the Greater Wellington Regional Council. Uh, but yeah, there was there was not a great deal of interest in, um, in single transferable vote. Okay, interesting. Yeah. Uh, I just noticed, Alan, there's a couple of people with their hands up. How do we deal with people with their hands up? Are we going to... 
they, they can keep, keep, might as well take their hands down because we're going to deal with the questions coming in the chat. So I think we should go to Caroline now. And yeah, I've got, I was going to say, I was going to move on to Caroline now, if that's okay. Um, um, the people with the raised hands, please, please type some questions in chat or, or, uh, and we'll get back to you towards the end there. Um, Caroline, um, welcome again, and thank you for joining us. Um, I'd like to talk about the, the, the post-referendum scenario now and see what benefits proportional representation has brought to, to New Zealand. Can you, can you give us some outline of what's, what's uh, been beneficial there? Um, okay. So the... Um... Well, I guess the big thing has been that we don't have, um, what's the name? We don't have safe seats anymore, or mm -hmm. we kind of do. But um, so we have these two cities in New Zealand, as an example. We have these cities of Hamilton and Dunedin that are about the same size. But Hamilton was always kind of balanced between national and Labour. Mm -hmm. And Dunedin... Uh, Labour tended to usually win all the seats. So what would happen in a case like that is that both parties would campaign in Hamilton and neither party would campaign much in Dunedin because, uh, yeah, it was only, it was places like Hamilton where it made the difference. And so now, um, now if you can win over, say, 5,000 votes in anywhere in the country that's worth the same as winning over 5,000 votes in another part of the country. And also the um, they start to put, because we have a, a system with electorate MPs and list MPs, the list MPs um, can be based anywhere in the country. So, for example, National have gone out of their way to make sure that they always have a list MP based in Dunedin, which um, which is good for the national voters there because they now always get an MP on their side of the house, which they didn't get before. So mm -hmm. even though the national party as a whole didn't benefit, you would say that actually the national voters, at least in Dunedin, have benefited in local representation. So that's one benefit. Um, another benefit, I guess, has been well, the fact that you get a lot more parties in Parliament. And so the um, so you get representation for a wide range of views. That's kind of shrunk a bit over the last 20 years as people have started going back to the major parties. But it still means that supporters of smaller parties our votes count wherever we are in yeah. the country well i was going to say that i mean that is quite a, an unusual feature of a proportional system where the big two parties are still hot, grabbing 80 percent roughly of of the of the votes uh, and yet you no one in new zealand seems to be worried about that is it because the the, the big two parties are quite adaptable within themselves and they're adopting policies perhaps from the smaller parties and incorporating them? What do you, what do you think about that? I think it's partly that. But the other thing that's happening actually is it, there's been a swing back towards the major parties because to some extent people are getting uh, disenchanted with the smaller parties when they don't seem to have had as much effect in coalitions as their voters had hoped they would. Okay. So they're not delivering, so why vote for them? Yeah. And so they say, well, okay, we may as well stick with the, the people we know, the major parties. Um, well, one of, one of the features of, of New Zealand politics, if you look at it, uh, and, and the, the makeup of New Zealand par Parliament is the growth of women in Parliament, and that was steadily growing prior to PR, prior to MMP, um, for various reasons, I guess, but it, it skyrocketed up. What, uh, yes. what, what really was behind all that? What was behind the skyrocketing? I think it's because um, there were probably more, there weren't a lot of 
women who were uncomfortable about voting for a man, but there were still mm. some men who were uncomfortable about voting for a woman. So what you got was um, that the number of uh, women shot up among the list MPs mm -hmm. rather than among the electorate MPs right. initially. And now I believe we have like the second highest female representation of any democracy at 48%. Uh -huh. Which is roughly the number of, you know, roughly in half, proportion, yeah. you know, just a few, few percent short. Uh, and that's certainly, shot, you know, gone up in the last, since the last election, in the last election. Um, what, what about um, representation of, of ethnic minorities and transgender people? How has that, has PR changed that for them? Um, it's hard to measure, but it's definitely gone up a lot. Mm. It's just hard to know whether it was actually due to the um, due to PR. But uh -huh. um, so now we find that particularly Maori people are represented proportionally, Asians and Pacifica a bit lower. Uh, you made a comment about transgender representation. We did have the uh, world's first transgender MP mm -hmm. in 1999, but she was actually elected um, in an electorate, not as a party list okay. MP. Mm -hmm. But that's that's the beauty about the list system then, isn't it? You've kind of highlighted one of the advantages that people who feel uncomfortable about being, you know, putting themselves forward for election, they, they can at least go on a list and they may be actually quite good and quite expert in certain things that they, they you know, they know about and get into parliament that way. And I think that's quite an important thing, isn't it? Quite a useful thing. Yes. Um, and most of them do actually stand in electorates also. But what happens okay. is that they'll stand in an electorate where, um, where the party can't win mm -hmm. just to try and increase the uh, the party's exposure in that electorate. Okay. So they're kind of, uh, yeah, playing, paying lip service, I guess, in, in that particular electorate. But they but they could still end up on... Can, can you actually stand as an in an electorate and also be on a list? You can, and it's encouraged. So okay. nearly if... The, it's very rare for somebody to stand in one and not the other. Mm. Because we recognise that actually about 90% of the job is the same. The only actual difference in job is that the electorate MPs get more funding for outreach to constituents. But even there, the list MPs do actually do constituent representation too. Okay, okay. Um, and one, one of the things that I guess, well, we all know that PR is capable of is, is actually drawing in some way, perverse way perhaps, drawing parties together after the general election because you have to form coalitions and you have to form partnerships with people. You know, the uh, Jacinda Ardern has recently famously won an, an election outright, and yet she's decided to, to bring on board the Greens. Um, so how has PR enabled that? Tell, tell us a little bit about that. Yes, so that's interesting because she didn't have to. Mm. Labour actually would have got a majority by themselves. So the, uh, I think there are two reasons for that. One of them was that she had experience of working with the Greens in the previous um, parliaments. Mm -hmm. And the other was actually a desire to keep that relationship strong for future parliaments and the expectation maybe that that in the 2023 election Labour probably wouldn't get enough to govern alone but Labour and the Greens would yeah. so it'd be good to be seen to be going into that election as a government mm -hmm. parties as a government together okay and and in general since PR has been introduced. Have those negotiations? Or we all know the one in 1996 was it was quite protracted and quite difficult with uh, New Zealand First, for example, um, making a, a political faux pas perhaps um, in, in their decision to join with National. But in general, are the negotiations fairly straightforward, fairly easy? Are there natural bedfellows in the coalition in New Zealand? More often than not, there are natural bedfellows. And so you just get um, a group of parties who 
it's obvious that they can form a coalition and they will go in to negotiate together and form a coalition or a often a cooperation agreement. Uh, this is something that you can't do in all countries, but in New Zealand, you can actually have Um, minority government which has support from parties mm. that they've negotiated to get support from. And there was one in 2008 there was actually an, a coalition that seemed like a strange, slightly strange combination where the Maori party supported National when they were not seen as bedfellows, so they weren't yeah. seen as the same part of the political spectrum. But the only way that the Maori Party could have any influence was by working with National. So the two of them just see, just decided, well, we may not be good beard fellows, but we can organise something and get some of our ideas through. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, and so I saw a general question, I suppose. News, the trust in politics was at rock bottom in 19... 70, 1980, in that, in that sort of period. How do you think it looks today? Well, at the moment, it's actually increasing. Um, this is, but I mean, this is something over the last three years or so that trust in politics seems to be going up and we seem to be sort of consolidating towards being a bit less politically divided. Mm -hmm. I don't know whether to attribute this to proportional representation. It, it seems quite likely, though, doesn't it? You, you're sitting on the fence there, Caroline. <laughs> yeah. I mean, imagine if it was still it first past likely. the post. Would... <laughs> yeah. I don't know, just because I might have seen it earlier if it was due to proportional representation. Okay. Um, well, do you think then that if, if this is the case, if if if, if confidence in the political system is increase is, is improving. Would you say that one of the things that proportional representation has, has done has brought New Zealand together? Uh, I, I read some comment when I was researching for the blog that uh, actually proportional representation was quite hard for some people to accept because it thrust the whole diversity of New Zealand in, into your face. You know, and if you're if you're a, a white male New Zealand, a middle aged or whatever, it might be quite uncomfortable to face that the the, the you know the the different the, the diversity of everybody. Um, but do you think by now uh, New Zealand has matured into a state where it's actually quite comfortable with itself and its diversity, and proportional representation has been an engine for that? Yes, and um, and it hasn't been just through a through a fracturing of different parties. It's also been through um, the major parties all trying to be more diverse. Mm -hmm. If like every party wants to convince you that it's a party for Maori people too. Every party wants to convince you it's a party for Asian people too. Right. Okay. So it's probably still some way to go, of course. Um, but I, I'm conscious of the time now. We probably need to start wrapping up. But I've got just a couple of questions for you and Phil, uh, very simply. And I'd like to ask the same question to both of you. Start with you, Caroline. Um, single transferable vote versus the MMP system. What would you say now is the best system for New Zealand if, if you had a choice? I would say MMP, and the reason for that is largely that we would have very large electorates if we had STV, mm -hmm. and, um, and so it would it would make it a bit harder to have local representation. There are quite a spread out population in comparison yeah. to Britain. So it suits it suits you as a country. What about you, Phil? What, what would you say if you could unmute yourself? Yeah, right. Thank you for that. Uh, good, thanks. A good question. Um, I've been involved in promoting both MMP uh, and STV. Um, we agreed that we were promoting MMP for the, at the level of parliament um, and the single transferable vote um, for local government. The, the, um, the Labour government, who, which um, Helen Clark's government, actually brought in the use of single transferable vote 
for all of our district health board elections. So everybody gets a single transferable vote when they're voting for their health uh, board area, uh, area representatives. Uh, but only about um, a quarter of the population, at least, is covered by um, uh, uh, city or cities or district councils where there is where SDB is used. Okay. Uh, a scattering of, of, of councils, rural um, rural districts and some cities, uh, including Wellington and that mm -hmm. area. But yeah, uh, we, we've, we've argued that the election of a under STV is the election for a person. You're choosing between people, you're choosing to rank candidates, and that's an appropriate thing to do in, this, in a city election or mm -hmm. a council election which isn't highly political. Uh, we don't have the same level of politicization of our council elections as you, uh, you do, where you have um, slates of candidates. Um, we have a lot more a region, a lot more um, cities and districts where the elections are fairly non-partisan. There's no, no party candidate standing. Um, some are, in some places there are, but um, even Labour stands under the name of 20, Citizens 2021 or something like that. Okay. They have, various um, uh, sort of um, uh, uh, ways which they can bring in uh, a diverse group of candidates, um, including Labour members, but some who are not Labour members. Uh, so that's that's how it works. And at the MMP, at the Parliament level, we've always argued that a 5% threshold, even though that's um, high, we'd like it to be lower, is a better threshold than you would get with MMP, with, with single transferable vote. If you have a single transferable vote system in a country like New Zealand, uh, you would have smaller representation of the smaller parties. Okay. Um, having a 5% threshold means that at least if you get the 5%, you, you get the representation. Uh, it would be possible for you to get, say, a 5% vote in, um, uh, in New Zealand and only have about, you know, say, a 2% representation if you had STV uh, because mm -hmm. you would miss out. You would be quite likely to be missing out in lots of areas altogether and you'd only have a scattering of members. I think that's the experience of Ireland um, where... The Green Party has less than its proportional share. I think yeah. that's the case. Okay. Well, the proportional representation has certainly been uh, a silver bullet for the Green Party in New Zealand, hasn't it, Caroline? Um, <laughs> you've done rather well out of it, and it's it's very good to see, of course. Um, but maybe a final question then, just to wrap th things up. For this is probably a question better, more for you, Phil. Actually, if you were to do the whole thing, the whole campaign again. Would you do anything different? I did see someone uh, come up with this question, you know, is there anything we actually did do that backfired or didn't work very well? Um, I think we were very fortunate that we had a sort of a following wind in lots of ways. Uh, we had the initial impetus towards um, the PR wasn't, had nothing to do with um, Roger Douglas or um, neoliberalism or, or, or the political um, uh, storm that developed in the 1980s um, in the UK and, and here. Yeah. And so you were sort of in the, uh, in the sort of burnout stage of that process. You, you're still uh, reliving the Tony Blair years um, through your present politics. We hadn't even started that when the MMP and, and, uh, came, became an issue. Uh, we'd, only jump below, we'd only just begun that process. So I think uh, we were very lucky that the, there was a huge disillusionment in New Zealand politics um, at that uh, coinciding with the rise of, of us talking about MMP. We suddenly found ourselves talking about a political system that was even more dysfunctional than people had ever realised. Yeah. Um, so it was, it was causing um, meltdowns within the parties, uh, first within the Labour Party and leading to splits, and when La National came into power, once again, National started to split apart because of the strains caused by um, extreme policies that were being put forward by the, the then Minister of Finance, Ruth Richardson, um, and that caused people to actually leave La uh, National. And we already had the people, Labour, splitting up into um, a sort of a, a left-wing group and a right-wing group, uh, breakaway parties, and a mm -hmm. centre group breakaway and everything, you know, and a Maori pa um, party yeah. later on, Maori party breakaway. So the parties were fragmenting and uh, that helped our campaign because it, it really emphasised to people that uh, there wasn't a, 
our two-party system, which had been very durable and which had been very, um, very, very um, uh, an extreme form of two-party system, we often had no other representation at all, just two parties. Um, before MMP, we had um, many years when there were only two parties in Parliament. Mm, absolutely. So yeah, we we broke with that mold was broken, um, yeah. shattered in the, in the 1980s. Well, it's it's interesting. It's interesting that uh, I mean, you, you don't have uh, a Liberal Party like we do, which is kind of all splitting the left of Tory vote. But it'd be interesting to you know if late if, if the UK Labour Party splits, um, which which you could easily do. I mean, there's 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 a very clear fault line. Uh, they're just waiting to happen, I think, and. Uh, the experience of New Zealand might be that actually a split into two separate parties might be a positive thing for PR. In New Zealand, we only talked about that in in sealed rooms. You know, <laughs> we, we, you've got an amazing situation in the UK where people are openly talking about PR being the solution to a problem that we did start to talk about, you know, I can, I can remember, you know, conversations, but it was all very off the record, you know. We never went to any, any meetings and said, now, the, the answer to our problems here is that we split the Labour Party and we have PR and everything, that'll all work out fine. Um, people started to twig on that this was it, where it was going. Um, but I think it was, I, th I think that there was by then that what the wider public was involved with the, and engaged with the idea that the parties actually needed to represent, you know, there needed to be parties that represented uh, what people wanted and that the parties had let us down. Yeah. Both parties, National and Labour, had let the public down. And that was a factor in people saying, no, we will switch to MMP, thank you very much. Mm. Mm. I well, think that is happening in the UK, that's how I see it. Well, I think, yeah, <laughs> the thing is, I, I get this impression the establishment is, is much stronger in the UK than it is in New Zealand, you know, the, the, the big power behind uh, behind everything. And I um, I some, somehow feel that uh, that drives everything in the UK. And I think that in New Zealand, it was less, the establishment was less uh, powerful. Would you, would you say that's correct? Or I don't know. Someone asked a question about the media and whether the British media would would make, would destroy a, a a PR campaign, a referendum campaign, for example. Um, and I think it's a, a really good um, question. I can't answer the question myself, but and I but what I can say is that we were very gratified when our big our, our country's biggest newspaper, the New Zealand Herald, became a. Mm. Uh, an MMP supporter, and we won just about every electorate in the northern part of the, the, the country, which is where the people live, most of the people live in the northern yeah. part. We won just about every electorate in that whole northern region um, covered by the New Zealand Herald. Uh, the South Island's a little bit more conservative where I live, and um, we did have a few holdout um, uh, electorates in the South Island uh, did not vote uh, in 1993 for, for MMP. Okay. Overwhelmingly, we got that vote in the northern part. Now, whether whether the media itself would change, um, whether, uh, whether the media would start to respond differently if you if your campaign becomes one more focused, more broadly focused on just political reform mm -hmm. um, rather than perhaps um, it's it's. It's heavily focused on, um, we've got to get rid of Boris and the only way we'll do it is, uh, yeah. I hear that a lot, you know, we've got to get rid of Boris and the only way we can do it is to, uh, is change to have the a, a change electoral system. And mm. I think that the, the very act of, of, of Labour promoting a, a proportional system would actually strengthen the chance of that happening um, because they would have a chance to win the election, win, mm. with, win an election in, co in coalition with others other parties, small parties, um, that they don't have without something really groundbreaking and uh, circuit breaking okay. in, like, um, in, in that way. So I think you're on the right track. I, I don't, I don't, dis I don't disagree with the, the line you're taking. Um, but um, I think that may ultimately cause the your your. Um, I don't. I just don't think you should be too frightened about the media. Um, I think you all, especially if you're not going for referendum anyway, um, you might find that um, the media will. Will start to real start to actually become more um, aware and treat it as the next big thing or a new thing, which is interesting and mm. uh, and um, you'll get a lot. You you might be surprised at how positive media com you know uh, content will be. 
Well, well, let's hope so. <laughs> You've got more optimism than I am on that one. But uh, Caroline, have you got anything to add finally before we hand over back to Alan? Uh, no, I haven't. Thank you. Okay, great stuff. Thank you. I'll jump in. Um, we're not going to answer questions about Canada and the Canadian election today. That's for another moment. Uh, we're not going to answer questions. We can do it later, but what are the differences between get PR done and make votes matter, etc. And I was planning to sort of have the questions in, in clumps, sort of how you got there and how it works now, but I've decided that's going to get all too complicated. So first of all, I'd like to have uh, uh, Alan, Ian, Phil, and Caroline, we can keep our microphones open. Uh, but uh, everybody else, please keep muted until I say unmute yourself. And the first person to unmute yourself is Helen Nash. You have two questions, Helen. Uh, one was early on and another was a later one. Could you ask their questions? Yeah, I'm just trying to remember them now. <laughs> um, the, the second one was about the internet, the... Um, or sort of detrimental on balance to, to the New Zealand um, campaign if you'd been running it in the age of the internet and, and how do you think it sort of, um, what impact do you think it's gonna have in the UK? Um, and, oh, the first question I can remember now is how, um, cut through to members of the sections of society who aren't normally interested in politics, did you achieve that with your New Zealand campaign? And did you, I mean, did you need to achieve that as well? And that's it. Well, if I can just start by saying one of the um, things that distinguished our campaign was that we had supporters all over the place. We had um, local campaigns in places we didn't even know we had local supporters. So, you know, it really, uh, we were winning places like Waipukara, which is one of the sort of very rural small towns of New Zealand. And it was an amazing experience to realize that we, that, you know, a country, a, a district that like always voted national was actually voting for um, MMP. So, and that was, that, just, that was a very strong um, difference between our campaign and the op our opposition campaign, which was basically a big business campaign funded uh, with about five times as much more, more money than we had. Um, and using a lot of fear tactics and scare tactics. It was all crying babies, um, people with paper bags on their heads to show that they were anonymous list MPs and you didn't know who they were. You were voting for you know, nobody, you were like you're voting for the un unknown. That was the kind of fear tactic that they were using. Um, but it was all being run out of Auckland. There was no, there was no grassroots um, uh, campaign to keep um, uh, the, the old system that was so discredited in one way um, that uh, even though they this, the opposition did make some inroads, we started out with like 80% support for MMP and that was whittled down to under 60% in the end. But um, we still had um, this huge level of um, support in small cities like Nelson and Palmerston North. They were sending up planes, you know, little local local people are paying or organizing planes to be sent up with, you know, vote MMP, you know, a little trailing message assigned over the, um, the town of Palmerston North. It was incredible. Right. Okay, that reached out. Okay, uh, next question. Um, this is a particular question, Peter Davison, about open lists. Uh, yeah, um, <laughs> I, I didn't really ask about open lists, making a statement, people worried about, about the dangers of lists being controlled by artists and their uh, accounts that might be seen as towing the party line and being rewarded for it, whilst and therefore more like elected system um, just I was just making the point that uh, you can avoid that pit if you have list systems having what called open list whereby the individual voter is the reader that listed uh, themselves are decided by the party thank you there Peter okay. I'm, a, I'm a fan of STV rather than list systems 
just before you guys answer, uh, Pete, Barry Edwards, you had a question as well about lists. Thank you. Um, it's very similar. Um, I'm worried about list systems where the party HQ controls the list order and might demote people out of favour. Do parties manipulate lists in New Zealand? If I can answer just briefly, I've already posted something in your chat there. Um, I just I can read it out if you like. Labour in New Zealand has an elaborate system of ranking candidates at regional level via meetings of members. Uh, the Greens, I think, have a strong membership control over the list. I suggested maybe even too strong. Um, they've, they've sort of lost people at times. Um, the uh, National Party's ranking process, I think, is more centralised. Um, but both, all the parties go overboard to attract support for their lists. You know, they, they really make the lists a showcase for um, to attract votes. They, uh, particularly the National Party, has uh, been um, um, promoting ethnic groups, uh, Chinese, Indian candidates, uh, Pacific Island candidates, um, who will never win in a national, um, uh, one of the electorate seats uh, that's national, uh, very unlikely to win, um, or be selected, but they do present them on the list and it's, it's a way of trying to gain um, broad support. Uh, so I don't, although there's certainly been um, questions about this um, right from the start, uh, about whether the list should be more open um, the actual experience that people have of, of the lists, I think, is, uh, has not been as uh, people feared. Caroline. Yeah, the, we actually have a, a legal requirement that the list selection within the party must be democratic. So um, I don't think the law is specific enough maybe about what that means. I'd like to see it made stronger. But as Phil's pointed out, the um, the Green Party and the Labour Party, at least, do actually select their party lists in a democratic way. And, and in the Green Party, I note that um, we often select our electorate candidates with a vote of about 10 people. We select our party list with a vote of uh, about five or 6,000 people. So I think that in practice, the list is more democratic within the party. Uh, another issue that comes up, though, is the power of party list MPs, or the power of any MPs to leave their party and um, caucus with another party, uh, which is called, gets referred to as Walker jumping, which is a, it's a Maori metaphor for kind of, for leaving one vote and joining another boat to row off with them in another direction. And um, so my view is that it's good that we currently don't have a law prohibiting this because it effectively keeps the um, parties beholden to the all the MPs on their list who um, might have attracted some of their votes, an assumption that sort of that they're all candidates who have gone out there and attracted votes to the party. Therefore, it's kind of up to them to keep the party honest. But um, yeah, there's also a widespread view that they shouldn't have the power to do that. Okay, I'm gonna ask a question because from Stephen Cook because he's on a bus and he can't answer the question directly. And, this is, and someone else had this question as well is the Labour Party New Zealand structured similarly to the British Labour Party? Union Link, CL, uh, 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 Parliamentary Labour Party and COPs, or is it more straightforward? Like it's a, the Labour Party is kind of extremely complicated and there's a lot of machinations going on right as we speak, getting ready for the con conference in uh, Brighton in three or four days. Just give us a little idea little picture of how decisions are made in the um, the uh, uh, New Zealand Labour Party, Phil? Sure. Um, we've, in, in the Labour Party, is, uh, New Zealand Labour Party has gone through the same kind of process that the British Labour Party uh, has gone through over the years. We started out with a, a system whereby the um, uh, party leader was elected solely by the caucus, 
and that was the same in Britain. Um, and over the years, we've we've now um, got a system whereby the party leader, um, uh, we've evolved a system in parallel with Britain, I think, uh, to where the, the unions have a, uh, a block, uh, a vote, uh, an input into it, and the membership have a vote and uh, input, and the uh, MPs have a vote and input into it. Um, and we, the uh, Jacinda came to um, power not through that process, but really because uh, the one, the, the man who was uh, elected by that process eventually um, appointed Jacinda as his deputy, um, with a bit of a fuss about that, and then um, uh, decided that it was that she was the right person to lead the party into the 2017 election. So yeah, that that system. Well, we do have the same, very similar system for electing the leader of the party um, that way. Okay. Um, Alan Fowler, and this is this question about referendums. You know, um, a number of us, like including me, are really not very much in favor of having a referendum uh, on PR. We, we sort of regard, uh, let people have a vote on PR and then maybe have a referendum. But uh, Alan, why don't you ask your question about Alan Fowler about referendums? Alan Fowler, I'll ask it for you. Okay. I'm not, yeah. I mean, yeah, basically, the question is just that in the UK, I think there's a fair amount of dis uh, you know, displeasure about the whole idea of referenda for reasons which I think you well understand. Um, if we were, you know, a lot of people in the Labour Party feel that we're best to just put this into a manifesto, that if you elect us or if we're uh, the leading party in some kind of coalition with other pro-PR parties, then if you vote for us, then that's our manifesto position and we're going to have PR. And we're not going to have a referendum. We're not going to go through all that stuff. We're quite suspicious about referenda. What do you uh, what do you feel about that? You know how, how does that go down with the with the people here on this forum? Well, oh, why don't we a second? Why don't we ask Phil and Caroline uh, like why the decision was made to go the referendum route rather than the legislation route in New Zealand? I mean, because I think Alan, we get into a big debate about that question of referendum. But why did you make that decision in New Zealand? Well, it was a pragmatic it's decision. It's actually a constitutional oh, requirement, effectively. You, oh. Well, to change the uh, 1956 Electoral Act, you would have to get either a majority in a referendum or a 75% majority in Parliament. So that rule effectively pushed towards a referendum. Oh, OK. Phil? Yeah. It was a pragmatic decision because the Royal Commission had said there should be a referendum. Um, and we, as I say, were starting from a very, very low base um, in, of, of support. You know, we had about uh, two or 300 uh, people on our mailing list. Um, and we, we simply couldn't just, uh, well, we, we could have um, decided just to start campaigning for MMP on its own uh, directly. But we, we campaigned for the Royal Commission's recommendation and gradually accustomed people to the idea of a referendum. And that became a popular cause. Um, the, the media would run opinion polls asking, you know, people, do they want a referendum on the voting system? And, and we got majorities that way. So we actually got people to say, yes, we do want, this is an issue, we want to talk about it. And we built up from that to the point where uh, we then were able to promote MMP um, itself directly. Okay, Kieran. You got two questions there about young people. Kieran? Kieran's not there. Can you remember any strategies that were yet were tried to gain support for PR during the campaign didn't work so well or backfired? And also, have you noticed any change in representative representation for younger people in general in parliament? You know, uh, we have a bunch of old farts in this country. Not all, but. Is more younger people, Caroline? Yes, there are more younger people. And, um, yeah, and I've noticed that various parties have been trying to actually prove their um, 
they're in touch with younger people by putting forward younger candidates. Right, and what about tactics during the campaign that maybe didn't work so well, Phil? I, I think that considering the way, yeah, considering the resources that we had at the beginning, um, we just we just got it right. You know, we we um, it's always hard. It's always a good question. To, it's always hard to look back and say, could we have done it better? And uh, I think the thing that we did succeed at best was um, bringing in um, people across a, a broad, very broad political spectrum. We did interest the, the uh, Maori organizations. We interested the trade unions in Duke, you know, eventually. We always had academic support. And we set out to, uh, we, we set out to be non-partisan we set out to make sure that we weren't just seen to be the representative of the smaller parties um you know so we're doing we did something very similar to what you're doing within the labor party you're, you're trying to make that a major party issue that the, the system should be fair and i'll absolutely stand by that by by talking about a system that's fair to everyone um we actually got broad support and we continued to grow in support uh, and that was unshakable, even when we had a multi-million dollar campaign in, you know, against us in the end. So it's that foundation of having going for a fair, a system that's fair for everyone was absolutely critical. Is it fair to say you guys were sort of the little people against this big sort of the big capitalists of New Zealand and we want for votes, for voters, you know, elections are about voters, not for parties or the establishment. It's for voters. It, it, did you sort of play that up, the kind of word, the little guys? To, only in a small way. We did at the end. We actually had a, uh, one of our cartoonists, um, one of the, you know, New Zealand's best cartoonists was on our side, right. made a large donation to us. And he put out a cartoon um, basically saying with his, you, I think, you know, Footrot Flats in the UK, the, the dog uh, in Footrot Flats. Um, he was, the dog was saying, um, um, if you're not sure about voting for MMP, look at who's asking you not to. Right. And it was a reference to the business round table uh, and the, the big money that was, was pouring into that campaign, uh, hate campaign against us. Yes, but we were also getting leading politicians on both sides were against PR. And there was this very wealthy big business campaign. So, yeah, that all helped to kind of portray the idea that the big guns are against it. This is about the little people. Right. Uh, okay. Uh, what about, uh, we're just sort of going to sort of start to wrap up now. I've been going for an hour and 15 minutes here. Um, how did you reach out to like trade unions? See, Get PR done is focused exclusively on winning over the Labour Party, because we felt that that was the key to change the balance of power on this issue, because it was previously two big parties and about 10 small parties. If we can win over one of the big parties, then we got a shot at actually getting somewhere. But, you know, what could happen? <laughs> Who knows? It could get turned down next week. And there's a question like, you know, we've been working so much through the Labour Party. How did like trade unions, women's groups, how did they get involved? Because you were not so sort of, you were sort of trying to win over the people more than winning over a party. Is that correct, Phil? Uh, we, we did spend all of our time at the beginning um, taking the campaign out to people and to the news media to educate journalists about what the Royal Commission had said. Um, and I used to, I toured around the South Island and around the North Island, um, you know, several times visiting all, you know, all, all um, visiting our supporters and talk to the news, news media. So we did start out that way, but as time went on, it, it became cr uh, very clear that um, the, 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 um, what, ha what was happening in within the National Party and within the Labour Party was going to be decisive. So if you haven't got support at the highest levels in those political parties, or one of them, um, then you know, you're know you really facing a big problem. And I think, um, I think, you really, I think you've, you've got 
um, a level of support within the Labour Party already um, that I, you know, I'd say we'd, we'd have been jealous if we were of that support if we'd, if we'd been in your, you know, in, at that uh, comparable time. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, we weren't getting that support uh, really at the at the senior levels of the Labour Party until right near the end. Yeah, we don't have that much support at the senior levels of the Labour Party. To be very clear for that, um, we have some, but not too much. Um, okay, um, let me see. Why don't we wrap up with a couple of questions, um, both from Caroline and from Phil? I know neither one of you are British, but you know, some basic things about the British system. If you would say several lessons that you have learned that we could, you know, we'll obviously consider them. We're not gonna, just because they did it in New Zealand doesn't make it right. But uh, what would your couple of top tips be uh, for in fact uh, succeeding in a campaign to win PR? Caroline? Um, I think trying to um, be uh, as multi, well, as non-partisan as possible, but trying to get support, just as much support as you can from diverse sectors of your society. Right, right. I mean, get PR done. Uh, I would be the first one to admit this. Does have a bit of an anti-Tory bias. We're very militant on non-sectarianism among Labour, the Greens, the Lib Dems, you know, we're really, it's its kind of an amazing fun Facebook group. No, you can't say that the leader of the Labour Party is a, that we, we really don't tolerate that. But current, if we win Labour over, then I think personally, there might be a bit of a shift because then we're trying to win over the whole country. Uh, Phil, any other top tips? I'll just um, back up what Mary has been saying on the chat line there. For Labour to change, we need to spend more time with the trade unions and Labour for a new democracy, says Mary. Yeah. And that's that's the lesson. I, I was told this, I went to one of the Labour Party meetings um, years ago, a Kilburn branch, and the guy said, don't worry about the academics, you know, don't worry about them, get the unions on side. That's the, that's the key. And I have never forgotten that. And, you know, although I was actually on the wrong side because I was um, more aligned to the sort of <clears throat> Blairite wing of the party um, at the time. Uh, well, so I was in the moderates, we would call ourselves. Um, but nevertheless, um, I, I learned the truth of that. And we did, we did deliberately recruit um, Colin Clark, uh, who was the retiring secretary of the Public Service Association um, to be our, um, our, our chair and president. Uh, he was a spokesperson, and we knew he had ear, the ear of people in the trade unions, and it was absolutely vital that we had that support. Um, and so, I recommend that if you if you you look for someone who's a retired uh, a retired trade unionist, um, to, to grab them, grab them every one you can get. Yeah, I mean that has been the, the it's well recognised that in the campaign for Labour for a New Democracy and get PR done as a part of that group, that the weak link has been trade unions, uh, that we have not done as good a job as we could have of winning over trade unions. 